In the spirit of sincerity and authenticity, I felt obligated to share the napkin from whence this lecture came from. So, without further ado, this is Mindful Games, where we explore the connection between culture, games, user experience design, and cognition. So, first, a little bit about myself. Um, well, I am a Vancouver business owner, so don't fault me for making the commute. I do co-own State of Wellness Massage Therapy, located only a few blocks from here with my wife, Robin, who's in the crowd right now. Um, in terms of my nonprofit work, I work with Game Lab. Um, it's actually Game Lab Oregon, sorry about that. Um, but uh, we, we function to provide emergent game designers with opportunities to play test and prototype uh, their newest ideas with actual users. And then, during my day job, well, yes, you'll often find me designing interfaces, maybe for sales purposes, maybe for HR, maybe for finance, but I like to push the scope of my responsibilities. I like doing live events. I like doing leadership development um, because it affords me opportunities to push the bounds, um, to address educational agendas, maybe behavioral modification. And then what do I do to unwind? Well, I build more games. So you might find my games uh, at Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, maybe being demoed at a games convention, or maybe you'll come to a dinner party at my house and we'll play some weird thing we're all, where we're all trying to kill each other. So how to unpack this topic? Um, I think we should start at the beginning. So the question being, how long has humanity been playing games? Well, the earliest archaeological evidence, um, thanks to Barbara Voorhees, uh, points to around 5,000 BC. However, um, you could make the point that it's most likely way before that, probably and with the advent of cooking that gave us the available proteins to make us smarter, that's most likely when we started to play. And, since, uh, and it didn't take us very long uh, for civilization to pick up on games as a very interesting and effective uh, social mechanism to provide a social glue of sorts. Um, even uh, in the early games, yes, often were blood sports, um, but they provided an opportunity for, well, folks to come to a centralized place, and as is depicted here, um, yes, you have your central players, but the crowd felt involved in the process. And just so those of us with, of European descent don't feel bad, A lot of cultures picked up upon this uh, strategy. Um, early Mesoamerican uh, civilizations used one of the earliest forms of basketball as their blood sport, much in the same vein as the Romans. And we have come so, so, so far since then. <laughs> and then we get to about 20 years ago, where we see something new emerge. We see the advent of, well, the age of esports. Now, what are esports? Is it something ESPN's doing? No. Um, or maybe, I don't know. Uh, so, esports, well, you're still coming to the arena or stadium, but now you're watching teams of individuals play video games against other teams of individuals seated at computer screens. And just to give you an idea of the popularity of these things, well, as of 2013, the championship for League of Legends well, garnered more viewers than Game 7 of the NBA Finals. And there is something different about these games. These games often are resource management games. Now, what do we mean by resource management? Well, just that. Uh, they're focused on input and output optimization, um, where you're trying to collect all the resources on the board, you're trying to put an infrastructure together so as to build more bases um, and most likely an army uh, to then send forth and conquer another person playing. Some games even go so far, such as EVE, uh, to put together uh, a virtual commodities market. That functions very much the same way, wait for it, Ooh. as actual commodities market. So we're starting to see templatable skills where you might not be so effective if you, well, uh, take your football skills and go to the cubicle environment. Um, well, at least the full contact skills. Uh, the, the resource management skills are easily templated. Now, this also signals uh, a very positive shift in 
what kind of players are being addressed with our new games. And uh, this model is thanks to Richard Bartle. He's a very nice uh, PhD who lives over in England. Um, he's willing to answer emails. So back in the day, we were primarily focused on the, well, the killer personality type. Um, why? Because we were, well, uh, humanity was very hard pressed to survive. Just daily survival was a chore. So the more aggressive you were, the higher chances of survival. However, now we have a kinder, gentler world for the most part. And in my research um, of a few hundred people surveyed thus far, um, I'm noticing a distinct trend that the killer personality type is often the minority of the players in the room. And the underserved category, well, that's our socializers. They're there just to have a good time, get to know one another. So I'm not surprised, wait for it, with the, uh, with the rise of games such as Gone Home, Her Story, um, which essentially invite the player uh, not to compete against another player or, or a system that's working against them, but to explore a map and create an empathic, a fresh empathic relationship with some other character's story. Some tabletop games even go uh, the extra mile, such as Story Cubes. Story Cubes, it doesn't use any points. There is no necessary winner or loser. The point of the game is to get together with friends, roll the cubes on the table, and then um, as a community craft uh, a story from the images depicted. Now, what does this have to do with software process, right? What, what does this have to do with my job? I'm a user experience designer. I make, well, software. Well, this is the quick and dirty software process. You know, um, I'm not going to explain it all. If you corner me during happy hour, I can probably do it, but I won't enjoy it. So where does user experience fall into this process? It falls in in the beginning, where we're trying to get the research, trying to get the users to tell us what they want. What do you want, users? How do you do your job? How are we supposed to build for your job? And then continue the conversation to be something real that can be built and gauge the ease or difficulty uh, with which our developers will approach the task. So what do I do to get this data out of people? Well, I bring out, uh, oh, and user stories always begin uh, with the phrase, as a user, I, and then an action. So what do I do to get this information out of people? Well, I bring out my user board, and then I put my user on the board, <laughs> and then I apply the truth serum, and then actually, no. You cannot use aggressive means to get quality or trustworthy data. That goes for mandated surveys as well as more aggressive me measures. What I do in actuality is I look for the junction where storytelling, which is an effective communication mechanism, meets games. Games because they provide a safe space where people feel like they can tell me stories. So I found the nexus in role playing, something I remember very fondly from when I was growing up and continuing into, you know, now. Um, I ask users to simply role play themselves. Tell me what their adventure is like. And to facilitate this conversation, I might bring, say, chess pieces. Tell me about hierarchy. Who else is on your board? How do they move? How fluidly do they move compared to you? Or maybe draw me a map. Draw me a map. Tell me about your work environment. Tell me about your cognitive environment. Or maybe I'll bring a bunch of weird stuff, like pipe cleaners. This user decided to immediately latch onto the pipe cleaners to make the hoops that told the story of all the hoops that she had to jump through just to do her job. <laughs> or I might bring fully functioning mini games. Uh, this is a version of planning poker, which again, if you corner me during happy hour, I'll explain, and I have a set on me so I can actually show you how to play. Um, this is part of agile methodology, and it essentially allows for difficult conversations to happen very quickly, and no one gets away with lying. Now, in these processes of games and storytelling, something very special happens, something that we can thank Uri Hassan for illuminating, um, and that's neural coupling. Now, that's, it's, it's a deep concept, but the long and short of it is, essentially, the story listener has their brainwaves align to the storyteller, and in so doing, there is an amazing potential for communication and retention of data from one person to another. 
So it's not surprising that as long as we've been evolving with games, we've probably been, been evolving with storytelling longer, and that's why that thing works. So it makes perfect sense that we would backtrack to that to, well, uh, help us go into the future, help us tell the stories that are needed to craft our future, and essentially uh, convey one authentic experience onto another person so that authen the authenticity of experiences is shared and we make those sincere connections that are so important to going forward. Thank you.